What's taking place in the Asian markets? Remember, uh, yesterday our markets were shut for trade. We saw an up move on the SGX Nifty, but then after that, we saw a bit of a decline in the American markets, and that is continuing in the Asian markets as well. They're trading cautiously in uh, today's trading session after the Federal Reserve decided to leave the rates unchanged. Nikkei is now down by about 0.7%. Straits trading with a cut of over 0.8%. The cost view, however, is meanwhile flat. We're seeing some weakness coming in the dollar yen, which is good news for Japanese exporters. Remember, two weeks ago, it was trading at around 111, now moved to around 114 or closer to the 114 mark. Good news, however, we're seeing a bit of a cut on the Nikkei. The SGX Nifty, however, most important, currently indicates a cut. At one point, was higher in yesterday's trading session as well, the previous trading session too. Right now, indicates a cut. will be very interesting to see how that pans out, given the fact that crude is sub-71. In fact, from its recent high of around $86 per barrel, crude prices have slipped almost 17%. So now currently trading around that 70, 76, 70 point six dollars per barrel mark. So in that light, it will be interesting to see how the markets pan out. Okay, well, let's tell you about the U.S. markets then. Stocks closed mostly lower as the Fed Reserve kept interest rates unchanged in a unanimous decision and signaled that it would continue to tighten monetary policy at a gradual pace. S&P 500, Nasdaq uh, closed lower while the Dow managed to eke out minor gains. Uh, CNBC's Aditi Roy gets us a wrap of all what took place on Wall Street. U.S. stocks finishing sliding lower after the latest Fed meeting. The Dow eking out a 10-point gain, the S&P off 7, and the Nasdaq down 39. The Federal Reserve voting to leave its benchmark interest rate unchanged, keeping it in the 2.2 to 2.5 percent range. Markets were not expecting an interest rate hike this time around, but are expecting a quarter point hike in December, the Fed noting a decline in unemployment since the September meeting. Meantime, Tesla replacing Elon Musk with Robert and Denholm as Tesla's board chair. Denholm has served on Tesla's board since 2014 and will be leaving her role as Telstra CFO to focus on Tesla full time. And Google is revamping its sexual harassment policies just one week after nearly 20,000 employees staged walkouts from Google offices around the world to protest how the company handled accusations of sexual misconduct in the workplace. In a memo to employees, CEO Sundar Pichai detailed the changes, many of which met the demands of protesters, including more transparency around sexual misconduct investigations and an end to the company's policy of forced arbitration. That's the action from the U.S. market. Back to you in Mumbai. All right, so that is the Dow eking out gain for four straight sessions. The Federal Reserve, however, kept their interest rates unchanged, as was widely expected in the November meeting. However, the central bank said in a statement that it expects further gradual increases. The Fed also did not mention the volatility that has hit the market recently. CNBC's Steve Leesman reports. The Federal Reserve kept interest rates unchanged at this November meeting in the range of 2 to 2 and a quarter percent, but signaled that rates will continue to rise. The market has generally taken that to mean another quarter point hike in the Fed funds rate will come as soon as December. Markets priced that probability in excess of 80 percent. The Fed had positive words to say about the U.S. economy, noting that the labor market continued to strengthen, that economic activity is rising at a strong rate, and that the unemployment rate has declined. They said household spending is also growing strongly, but they took note that business investment had moderated from its prior rapid pace. The Fed continues to see inflation near its 2% target. All of this sets up a potentially fraught December meeting for the Fed, where markets expect the central bank to hike. But President Trump has complained that the Fed is moving too fast to slow down the economy and undoing the effects of the tax cuts to speed the economy up. Fed officials argue that the current rate is low enough to keep stimulating economic growth, given the high rate of growth itself and the low level of unemployment. Officials say the policy rate should be neutral, if not even a bit above. But those are questions for December and into 2019. For November, the Fed took a pause. Okay, well, on that note, let's get in some opinion from David Kelly of JP Morgan Fund on the Fed's rate trajectory. 
We can absolutely see a slowdown in the second half of 2019, down to about 2 percent growth. I think we would need a shock to put us into recession. And in terms of the rest of the world, uh, I don't think the rest of the world is doing that badly. I mean, when we look at PMI indices around the world, uh, emerging markets are a little softer, but there's no disaster going on. India is doing extremely well. China is growing a little bit more slowly. But we're just not seeing a shock to the global economy. And this is a very stable U.S. economy, very stable global economy. It, takes a, it does take a shock, I think, to put this economy into recession. Mm -hmm. We don't quite see that right now. The Fed is almost on a preordained course of only raising once a quarter. A big trade war is the biggest risk to the global economy, and it's also the biggest risk to the U.S. economy. Um, and uh, so really my slight optimism that we avoid a recession really is predicated on the idea that we do a deal with China at some stage over the next few months and we don't ramp up tariffs. If we ramp up tariffs, we may think we're hurting them, but we're going to hurt us a lot more. All right, so from the markets to the macros, let's come to the political developments. The results of the 2018 midterm elections are a referendum against the U.S. President Donald Trump's policies with the Democratic victory in the House of Representatives with 223 seats. The Republicans narrowly expanding their majority in the Senate. And here's some opinion coming in from experts on what this means for the U.S. markets and the economy going forward. I don't think any of us can remember an election where actually everyone was happy with the outcome. Uh, you know, there was, there was something to like for Democrats, Republicans, and from our point of view, especially for international investors, a very strong signal from the bond market yesterday by yields not racing higher like they normally do when you have the stock market as strong as it is. It's more, it's more than just, uh, you know, the prospect of uh, not expanding the budget deficit. To, from additional tax cuts, it's de-risking in the minds of international investors the political situation. It's the whole checks and balances, whether that in fact turns out to be the case, but it's all supportive of the market and team. We're supposed to have wage gains every year, and then we're going to get one quarter of wage gains, and everybody's like, oh, we got to shut down this growth rate because it's too big. Uh, I don't think, I, I hope that we're moving into a period where wage gains are going to be bigger for, for ordinary workers, not just overall in the economy concentrated on one, one sector or one group of people. But I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. We're going to have to see. We certainly didn't see it in the previous quarter, so that, that we got one good, good quarter yep. of data. I you th think I the think Fed? So. I think the economy is going pretty well, but there's certainly things like big trade war or or uh, you know slow down of the of the stimulus part of the tax cut that could make the growth rate not as impressive maybe as what the fed thinks all right, then, across the Atlantic, the European markets ended on a mixed note ahead of the Federal Reserve meeting. In terms of data, the German exports, that came in, and they fell unexpectedly in September, narrowing the country's trade surplus. The European Commission also said that the growth in the Eurozone will stall in the coming years. So we saw some cuts in the French as well as the German index. FTSE was higher, and that was led higher by a lot of consumption stocks. So the likes of Coca-Cola moved about 5% higher. We also saw gains come by in Marks & Spencer as well as well. So consumption stocks doing fairly well. In the other peripheral indices, we saw a sharp uh, cut. In fact, for the Italian index, that one was lower by about six tenths of a percent. More importantly, from uh, the emerging market space, though, while the Russian index was lower by about seven tenths of a percent, it was the Brazilian index, which had been outperforming from the start of this month, still is an outperformer. Gave up some gains, down by about two and a half percent, led lower by industrials, consumption, as well as the financial stocks. So that index was something which outperformed rather underperformed across the board. But with that, uh, we have some more. Yes. Uh, in fact, let's get on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive then. Mark Mobius, the founding partner of Mobius Capital Partners, says the market probably will not do well going into next year. Here's a slice of that conversation on what he makes of the global markets. The rally is probably connected to the oil price, lower oil price, which is very good for the U.S. economy. And by the way, emerging markets, uh, it's a good news. But uh, I think going forward, you're going to have gridlock in the U.S. And the ability of Trump to be able to get another tax cut will not be good. Uh, because that's what people are counting on, another tax cut. And therefore, the so market probably is not going to do very well going into the next year. So, so, Mark, you think investors had already fully priced in another tax cut and the, the lack of that will be uh, a negative for the market. Do you think the economy will slow down next year as well? 
Uh, yes, of course, there'll be a slowdown because year on year, you're going to have a comparison with an incredible year this year. And then next year, it'll be very difficult to match that kind of increase. So I think you'll get a little bit of a slowdown. I'm not talking about a recession, but a slowdown. Uh, Mark, in light of that, I mean, historically, we've had a number of folks who've come on our air in recent days and have said, as long as the midterms are done, it lifts the level of uncertainty off the market and gridlock still historically is good for stocks. It sounds like you disagree with that. Uh, yeah, I disagree because a lot of things that Trump has done has been very good for the market. And of course, that's the reason why we've had this incredible rally in the U.S. market and a continuing bull market. But next year, I don't think he's going to be able to pull many rabbits out of the hat. And that'll be a real difficulty for him. Uh, Mark, talk us through your view on the U.S. dollar, uh, whether it's midterm related or, or not. Clearly, it's had some decent strength uh, since uh, the sort of uh, spring time. Do you think that's going to abate now the dollar strength? And, and what does that mean for uh, international equities that you focus on so closely? I think so. I think what you're going to get in, in the euro, for example, a higher interest rate and therefore more money going into the euro side, weakening the dollar. And also, don't forget that a lot of the other currencies have already had massive uh, declines. So this is over. And going forward, I believe the U.S. dollar index will probably move sideways and maybe down. So is it a buying opportunity for emerging market equities? I think so. If you look at uh, some of these markets, they've already rallied. Brazil is up 20 plus percent in dollar terms. So there's mm -hmm. tremendous opportunity now in many of these emerging markets. Where do you see the biggest opportunities? I think India would be at the top. Uh, Brazil also looks good. And then after that, some of the smaller markets uh, in Asia, Vietnam looks very good. And Malaysia is another market we're looking at very closely. All right. So that is Mark Mobius bullish on India. So we'll, we'll keep an eye out on that, how that pans out going forward. But let's take a look at the currency space then. The dollar index, uh, that's trending after advancing past its peers, buoyed by Fed's largely upbeat economic outlook and its intent to keep tightening monetary policy. In the world of commodities, crude oil prices struggle near eight-month lows as investors focused on swelling global crude supply, which is increasing more quickly than many had anticipated. Right then, let's take a short break. Come back, we focus on our markets, all the cues and news you need to know for trade this morning. Still tuned into Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. Well, back home on the Lal Street, it was a positive Maharaj session with major indices gaining over half a percent each. The Nifty ended just below 10,600, while the Sensex ended above 35,200. Broader markets, mid caps outperformed, while banks were in line with the frontliners. Well, Manglam. Uh, what can we expect today? Well, the motor trading session was indeed a good one. As we saw, you know, the Nifty, the Sensex, as well as the Midcaps and the Nifty Bank, all of them doing fairly well. However, we also need to keep in mind the motor session usually has very low volume. So the total cash market volumes on the motor trading day were just about 4,500 crores, which is $0.8 billion. Even the institutional flows in on a gross uh, basis were no more than about 100, 200 crores in the cash market. But there were a few flashes in the pan as far as some trades are concerned concerned oil marketing companies, they gained a fair bit in the motor trading session. That can be attributed to the fact that Brent prices or Brent crude is now sub $71 per barrel mark. In fact, from its recent highs of around $86, Brent has slipped about 16-17%. Just to put things into perspective, the last time Brent was at 86.1 was on October 4th. That time the Nifty was exactly where it is right now. The same time when uh, the Brent was at 70.1. In August 17, the Nifty was 11,471. Not to say we're running away to that mark right now, given, you know, from then the currency has weakened a bit. We've had other de debt conditions as well as some, uh, you know, some more triggers as far as our markets are concerned. But that is just a data point I'd like to put on the table. As far as uh, the Morad session is concerned, there was a fair amount of action in the index future space. The FIIs bought about 165 odd crores. And from the start of the series itself, the FIIs have been buying in index futures. They started net short. They're still net short, but the shorts have reduced. At the series start, the FII 
price were just 29% long and that has increased to 37%. That is telling you that from the start of this series, while the FIIs bought about 30,000 short contracts in index futures or added 30,000 short contracts, that means for that they've added 54,000 long contracts, more bullish than bearish. That's telling you uh, that, you know, there is support at the lower end as well, given the FIIs have written more than double the number of puts from the start of this series than they have in terms of short calls. Uh, at the higher level, however, it will be very interesting to see whether we do go ahead and breach that 200-day moving average of 10,760 or not. Beyond that is the 50-day moving average. But as of now, the 10,760 mark also indicates we have some up room for about 150, 200 points. At the same time, keep an eye out on key triggers. Debt market conditions most important because remember, Chris Hill said that 70,000 crore worth NBFC papers are up for renewable. Then there is the domestic political news. They have five state elections in November and December. And finally, the remainder of the second quarter results. So those are bigger triggers. But the biggest trigger today would be the fact that crude is sub $71 per barrel mark. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Manglam. But what about the stocks and news? Well, a lot of stocks. We start with results. We have Titan, uh, one of the last few Nifty companies reporting its results today. So keep an eye out on how the jewelry segment performs out there. Margins in the watch division will also be uh, closely watched. Apart from that, we spoke about crude. So oil marketing companies, they gained on the Mura trading session. Let's see with more volume today what happens to these crude sensitives paint companies they stand to benefit most right now given they've taken price hikes and the crude has stabilized along with the rupee so let's see whether there is some up move there or not uh, all the aviation stocks as well is something that i'll be watching out for ekta you've been talking about fortis for a very long time now the ceo bhavdeep singh has resigned after a net loss in the second quarter has spiked six times so that is something we will keep an eye out on emphasis they've gone out uh, gone out shopping made an acquisition of to the uh, of a company US-based company to the tune of $25 million. Bharti Airtel, Moody's has put the company's rating on review for a downgrade, so let's watch out for that. NMDC, that stock will be in focus because remember, uh, the previous trading session, we saw a decline in NMDC. Uh, that's primarily because we understood that that time the Doni Malai mine was shut or the lease on that had come off. Now the company has gone ahead and informed exchanges that the lease, the lease date for the Doni Malai plant has been renewed for 20 years, so that is a positive for them. Uh, Bharat Financial, the company has completed its fourth securitization transaction of nearly 4 lakh uh, uh, 42,988 uh, 42, odd crores. Canfin Homes, they've reported their results. The disbursement growth has picked up, but the loan growth is the slowest in the last nine quarters. In terms of results, watch out for MRF as well. Their net profit has been down 12, 12.5%. Revenues have been up by 9.5%. Let's see where that stock goes. Given the previous two tyre companies post reporting a weak set of numbers, the stocks did move higher. And then we have sugar stocks. They will be in focus. They have been on their own bull run for the last few months. And now there is further news that exports from India to China will begin soon and that should support the sugar prices and in turn all those sugar stocks. Okay, all right Manglam, thanks very much for that. We'll take a break now but there, here is some opinion from market veteran Ramesh Damani on what he makes of the market in the new Sambat. What happened in the last few months was a correction, a break in the bull market rather than an ending of the bull market. So I remain optimistic about the year ahead. The <clears throat> bull market that started in 2013-14 is still intact. It's gone through a very severe test, uh, uh, almost like a crisis of confidence. But the way the market is behaving after that, it's bouncing back. My sense is the way the market's fighting back at the 10,000 Nifty level suggests that uh, you know all is not at an end. That the market will has found its feet and is fighting back. I think corporate earnings are also starting to roll. So I think. The fears of the market, of course, are oil prices and the rupee depreciating, both of which have seemed to have stabilized. I think elections, U.S. elections, these are all, you know, the wall of worry that the market has to climb. I think as long as oil remains uh, below 70, 75, I think the market will uh, continue to power up size, up, upside. 